the cheese extra? Like the most at home. Um, yeah, I don't know if I can hold it oh. the whole time, but I'll try. Well, she said in case. It's not. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm very pleased to be with you this evening. Uh, as you said, my name is Dawn Rowe, and I am the third great-grandchild of Solomon Culver, who came here to Sterling in the 1830s, and tracking him down has been quite an endeavor. I started doing my family tree in the mid-1980s, or 1980s, uh, early 1990s, and one of the first people that I contacted was Haley Sweeting. Uh, obviously, you all remember her. That uh, turned into a uh, lifelong friendship with her, and we had planned on doing a newspaper article together, co-writing about Solomon and uh, his uh, brothers, or, or uncles, and that did not happen because, uh, as you know, Haley Sweeting passed away. So I thought uh, with new research that had been achieved that it would make a nice program to come back to the ancestral home of Solomon Culver. Anyone who researches the Culvers, this would be one of the first resources that you will find. And it essentially is what I call the Culver Bible. And you can search this book as much as you want because we're not in it. <laughs> and it's a very good resource, but it does not cover uh, Solomon's branch that came here. And it wasn't until 1984 until a second book is published. And Valerie did a wonderful job. We're almost in this book, but it's from this book that I've been able to tie Solomon to his father and trace his ancestry all the way back to England. So I'd like to review just a little bit of what's available on his ancestry. The Culvers are a very old colonial family. They came to the United States. Uh, they first appear in Boston in 1635. Edward Culver was a millwright. He is a founding um, immigrant to the U.S. He is the 68th signer, so he's recognized as a co-founder of Dedham, Massachusetts. He is said to have been a scout in the Pequot War of 1637. He married Ann Ellis the following year, and then he moved to New London, Connecticut. He owned a 400-acre estate that the Indians labeled as Chapetos, and in 1662 he became a baker and a brewer. And then eventually he moved to Mystic, Connecticut, where he passed away. This is the descent that Valerie put in her book from 1984 um, that leads us to our branch. Uh, we come from consecutive branches of John Culver. Um, John Culver, the son of Edward, was born in Dedham, and he was appointed to drum on the Sabbath uh, in the year 1668-69. And he was clever enough to ask them for compensation to pay for his drum and drum head that he should be awarded land. And he actually succeeded. They did give him land for his services. He died in Groton, Connecticut in 1725. And he married second uh, Mercy Clark. There's some controversy over who his first wife was. Some say that she was a Winthrop who was a granddaughter of the governor of Connecticut. However, I can't confirm that. John had a son uh, also named John, who was born in 1670 in New London. He uh, eventually moved to Schoolies Mountain, New Jersey. And that decision to go to New Jersey is one of the main reasons why you will not find traditional genealogical proof of this family. One, it had a large impact to do with their religion. And we'll get to that in just a minute. John married Sarah Long, and she was known as the Singing Sister. He was a saddler by occupation, and he was a Rogarine leader. And Rogarine was the name of their religion. That was their faith. The Rogarines were considered very odd people. They suffered persecution, and they didn't fare too well in Connecticut, and that was the reason they went to New Jersey for religious freedom. John III, um, the third generation, had another son that he named John, and he was baptized in 1700, likely in Groton, and he died in Black River, New Jersey in 1733. And his wife was Free Love Lamb, the daughter of Isaac Lamb. And Isaac also had descendants who lived in Cato. So not unusual to see some movement coming to Cuba County. John was a cord waiter by occupation. Does anybody know what that is? He was a shoemaker. 
different from a cobbler because he would actually make the shoe from leather, uh, not just repair the shoe. So that, that was his occupation. This is the suggested family from Valerie's book, um, The Next Generation of John. And she says he's probably born uh, around 1729. Abigail's last name is another source of great controversy. It's Crossman, Crassman, Corman. There's many variations of her last name. I cannot tell you which one is correct. And she suggests that he may be the John Culver that moves to Schoolies Mountain. And I'm in agreement with that based on the movement of the children that you see listed there. The only thing I'm not in agreement is the dates that she has. The date that she has for John Culver, born in 1758, is actually Samuel's date. And Samuel is Solomon of Sterling's daddy. He had a um, brother, Phineas, who was born around 1762-64, uh, who married Phoebe Breeze, and they lived out in um, uh, Tioga County. This would be the correct listing that I would, from my own research. Samuel was born in 1758. Joseph I have not found, but they say he was born approximately 1760. Phineas' um, birthday came out to be 1761, and then John born in 1762. So I'd like to just review the brothers here, if I could, for a moment. Well, first I want to go into the Roverine beliefs um, that they had in, uh, in Jersey. They believed that only adults should be baptized, that the healing was by prayer, not medicine, so they did not believe in formal medicine. They did not believe that prayer should be spoken, it should be mental. And they only believed in communion at night. And they also believed in working on the Sabbath. They did not like paid preachers, and nor taxes. So you have to keep in mind in this period, the Congregational Church was the only church recognized by the colonial government. And that church was supported by taxes. They refused to pay those taxes, so they were often arrested um, and really was not willing to bend their faith to follow what everyone else was doing. They also did not believe in war, and they also were against slavery. Many of these beliefs are very similar to the Quakers, and they were friends of the Quakers, but they adopted some of their own unique rules onto that religion, and kind of that's why they started calling them Roguerine. They did not believe in any monuments to the dead. If you go to look for Edward Culver and his wife, Ann Ellis, all you're going to find is a rock with an AC on it and an EC. The formal monument that was installed was installed by uh, descendants years, years later. A branch of the Roverines ended up going to uh, another section of New Jersey, and they became known as the Culverites by all the locals. And Solomon's ancestors were part of this branch. They, uh, like I said, they were willing to be arrested um, for their beliefs, and they often were, and they especially enjoyed disrupting paid preacher services. Uh, there's a few stories that I've heard of that, you know, they, uh, very unethical behavior from, from what published books say. And this religion and these people kind of have been forgotten in history because they were labeled as weird. And I have to say, some of it, it's probably true. <laughs> the uh, youngest son, John, um, everyone believes that he is the John from Tennessee. And he may be, there's no formal proof or communication with the New Jersey brothers to suggest that he is. But um, he certainly is born in the right place at the right time. He uh, was a soldier of the American Revolution. He enlisted in Sussex County. Sussex County was actually part of Morris County and was reformed. But that's important because that's where the proof of Solomon's daddy comes from, is knowing what county you're looking at. After the war, he moved uh, for a short period for a summer to Summit County, Maryland. And then he moved to Gulford County, North Carolina where he married Sarah Bailey, and then eventually he moved to Tennessee, where he passed away. There is no formal proof that ties him genealogically to the rest of the family other than the location. So chances are very good that this probably is, is correct. Now, Samuel had a brother, Phineas, and he also uh, claimed to be a soldier of the American Revolution, but he had quite a tough time getting the application approved. His lawyer quit on him. He was charged with forgery. 
um, because a slip was submitted for proof of service that they thought they felt was um, forged and was false. And uh, so he had a real tough time of it. But in his testimonies comes enough information to place him at the Schooley Mountain, New Jersey callers. And the second line um, says he was apprenticed out to Timothy, says wires in the uh, application, but that's very similar to Weir, which was a very well-known name among the Rovereens. And he was forced to work on the Sabbath. And because of that, he ran away and supposedly joined the army. And working the Sabbath is yet another trait of the Rovereens. Um, and in 1779, he enlisted at Hackettstown, and this particular group of Culverites, that's where they settled. So he's right in the stomping ground of these people uh, known as the Culverites. And the other thing that kind of uh, surprised me from these testimonies was that there was testimony that Phineas and his mother were living with John Hill's father two miles from Hackettstown. Well, where's Mr. Culver? So I think we're looking at a displaced family and families that were apprenticed out. So that's why the boys aren't living exactly uh, in the same household. After the war, Phineas um, worked at Mount Hope Iron Mills, also in Morris County. And I did discover that in addition to applying for the pension, he also applied for bounty land. I do not have this in my personal collection. But for those that descend from Phineas, this may be something worth going after because it may have more testimonies that might be helpful. But here you can clearly see at the end it says that um, he's not entitled to bounty land. So he, he definitely kept pushing the issue uh, of being a soldier, but it's possible he may have. If he ran away from home, would it not be unreasonable to think maybe he enlisted under another name? So. If you put credence to that, I think it's possible he may have served, but all the drama that came with his application that I can't say, you know, for sure whether he did try to falsify his application to better his stance. Around 1791, Phineas reported that he moved to Tioga Point, PA, before moving to Newtown. And Newtown was the early name of what we call today Elmira. For a while, he lived in Bath, and he bounced back and forth between Bath and Elmira where he married Phoebe Breeze, and then he moves back to Bath. And the Breeze name shows up in some land deeds with Solomon who settled in Sterling. So we definitely know that there, there's kinship there. Phineas also was a deputy sheriff for Steuben County, or in Hector, before moving to back to Bath. And he rotated between Ithaca and what was called McIntyre Settlement in the east part of Hector. In 1842, in his pension claim, he said that he was attempting to get to his family in Illinois. And sure enough, his wife shows up in the 1850 census in Illinois. So there's enough truth to a lot of the testimony that he provides that gives some credence to it that, that maybe there is a chance that most of his testimony is truthful. He died somewhere between 1844 and 1848. Now his brother Samuel is Solomon's daddy. He was born in Roxbury Township. He enlisted at Hardwick, which was also part of Sussex County. And that's not too awful far from where his brother enlisted. He served with the 2nd Regiment New Jersey Militia, and he was discharged in 1783. And I can confirm that he was a soldier based off this official register of officers and men of New Jersey. He served in the state troops and militia, and there he is in Sussex County. So there's absolute truth. He was denied a pension. There's his denial. The reason he was denied was because the benefit he was applying for was for the Continental Line, which was Federal Army. He served the state militia. They would not be eligible for this benefit. So it doesn't mean he was not a soldier. It just means he wasn't eligible for this particular pension act. In 1783, he married Phoebe Pollard. And I think that if you'll notice in the census reading, Solomon always used the middle initial P. I have to assume the P may have stood for Pollard after his mama's surname. And he uh, married Phoebe in Mendham, which was the birthplace of his wife, which was only 35 miles from Hardwick, where he enlisted. He then moves to Northampton County, Pennsylvania, and he worked in a mill called Brinker's Mill, which was in Scioto. He does not testify himself that he lived in Pennsylvania, but most of the census readings for his son Solomon 
well, primarily say he came from Pennsylvania. But there's also census records that say he's from New Jersey, New Hampshire, New York. <laughs> so trying to find exactly where was Solomon born has been very, very difficult. But thanks to Phineas's testimony in his pension application, this testimony from Jacob Weiss was really an eye-opener. I was able to find that Samuel was on the tax rolls for three years. When he first was in Pennsylvania, he was on the tax roll for one horse and one cattle. By the end of uh, 1788, he had two horses and two cattle. And it's at this township that Solomon was born. And here is the um, testimony that uh, says in 1787, he worked at Brinker's Mills in Hamilton County, and that fit, excuse me, Phineas came to Pennsylvania to ask Jacob to testify that he was a soldier in the war to try to get his pension approved. And he happens to say that Phineas's brother Samuel worked at the mill at the same time he did. So now I have more information that gives me exact county and township uh, where Solomon was born. But then I got looking at Brinker's Mill, and I have a real treat for you this evening because I actually found a little history clip that I'd like to share with you that gives you the history of this mill. The old mill in Scioto sits along Route 209 in Monroe County as a quiet reminder of America's past. A mill stood at this location before the United States of America ever existed. It not only produced flour as well as feed for livestock, it served as a storehouse and post for the military. This is the story of a piece of American history and how it is being preserved today so future generations may remember its contribution to this country. Brinker's Mill was first built as a log structure as early as 1729, a good 47 years before America's Declaration of Independence. It was constructed by Jacob Brinker along the McMichaels Creek in Hamilton Township. It was built primarily of logs. The old mill was located along an important route which took travelers from Easton to Wilkesbury. It was because of this that it became an important stop for General John Sullivan. His expedition of 1779 to quell the Iroquois Indians brought him to Scioto. In June of that year, the expedition used the mill as a storehouse for supplies and as an advanced post for about 4,000 men. I cannot stay in my shop any longer. I must take up arms and fight against them. The massacre in Wyoming was a very bloody thing. In 1790, the mill changed hands from Jacob Brinker to John George Keller. By 1800, the log mill had deteriorated and was replaced by the present structure, built by Bernard Fenner. The operation of a mill is quite ingenious. It uses the force of water to move a stone wheel that grinds the grain. So a mill is built along a creek or stream where a dam is then constructed. The water flowing over the dam provides sufficient and constant volume to move a water wheel. The new mill at Scioto had what is called an overshot wheel. It is very efficient and it can harness over 85% of the potential energy in falling water. However, it is more difficult to build. Mounted vertically on a horizontal axle, it has angled troughs, also called buckets, mounted all around the rim. Water fills these buckets from above, making one side of the wheel heavy and causing it to turn as the water in the buckets fall. At the bottom, the buckets are in an inverted position so that they spill out the used water, which flows gently away. The overshot is primarily a gravity wheel in that it is the dead weight of water in the buckets that causes it to turn. It was quite a sophisticated operation for its day producing various types of flour as well as feed for livestock. Eventually, the overshot wheel had to be replaced. Flooding rains in the summer of 1935 damaged the mill. The wheel was replaced with a turbine. It operates on a similar principle as the tub wheel. 
The turbine is composed of numerous doors on hinges that allows the miller to open the doors at varying degrees, allowing as much water as he wants to pass through the turbine. The more water he releases into the turbine, the faster the shaft will turn. Wooden water wheels consistently had to be repaired. Rotten wood had to be replaced. The turbine required virtually no maintenance, and it was efficient and powerful. Today, a breast shot water wheel is installed at the old mill for historical and demonstration purposes. The mill owner was a prominent person in the community. He would often barter or trade his services with customers. For example, he may exchange food or clothing for flour or feed. This is what life at the old mill in Scioto may have been like in the early 1900s. Too bad. We need some flour. We got a lot of baking to do. I got some grain to drop off. Well, we have the flour. And who's this young lady? This is my granddaughter Olivia. Good morning, Mr. Snyder. Good morning, Olivia. She's never seen a mill operate before. She's been talking about it all day, so I brought her along. And would you show us the process? I sure will. If you step inside, we'll start out. Sure enough.
If you'd like to contribute or find out more about the Old Mill at Scioto, contact the Old Mill Committee in care of Hamilton Township, Post Office Box 285, Scioto, PA, 18354, or call 570-992-7020. So to have any evidence that can place Solomon Calder's daddy working at this mill is quite rare. Uh, he worked at the mill um, in the early part of the history, uh, back when Mr. Brinker owned it, when it was a log-style uh, structure. The mill that you just saw here was built in 1800. Uh, but still rare, it still shares its history, even though it's a separate uh, construction, but it is located on the same site. After living in Pennsylvania and working at the mill, Solomon's daddy moves to Independence, New Jersey, about 30 miles away. And in 1821, he came to New York and settled in Elmira. When he was attempting to get his pension during the American Revolution, uh, he came to Seneca County to visit who I believe is Solomon, and he passed away while he was on the trip. So his pension was never approved because he could not prove that he served in the Continental Army. If you read the militia book that I displayed earlier, it goes into a lot of history on how some of these soldiers were detached and actually became reinforcement troops for the Continental Army. And during those type of services, they would be considered Continental soldiers. So if Samuel had lived, I do believe his attorney was going to attempt to establish that to get his pension approved. However, he did not live. His pension claim was closed. And that was uh, pretty much the end of that opportunity. So you say, how do we know Solomon is Samuel's son? Well, he testified. There is a document in the pension that says he testified from Sterling that he was a legal heir to Samuel and Phoebe Calder, who was a soldier in the American Revolution. And if you notice at the bottom, uh, John Hunter, that's probably a name that many of you recognize here in Sterling. Uh, he actually uh, signed it and verified that Solomon was indeed Solomon Caller. There is one bit of testimony in this pension that I could not quite place, and that is a testimony of a sister named Phoebe Ann. Interestingly enough, Phoebe Ann, the sister, is the same age as Phoebe Ann, his daughter. So I don't know if maybe Phoebe Ann, the daughter, may have stretched the truth a little bit. Um, I could not place any other Phoebe Ann Calder living in Seneca Falls. But Phoebe Ann, uh, his daughter, that's where she lived. So one has to wonder if that may have been just a little bit of a stretch to try to put food on the table. Uh, something that's not uncommon, what people did it back during the uh, Depression with the um, stamps. If you had a child living in your household, you might give them your last name to make it so you don't have to explain yourself to, so you can get your coupon book. Um, we have seen evidence of that with other families. So that's the only thing that looks suspicious to me in the file. Otherwise, everything else I was able to confirm and it did uh, pan out. So now we're going to get to Solomon, who is our, our star of the night. My grandmother had always told me that her great-grandfather was a reverend. And I hunted and hunted. She thought he was a Methodist preacher. Well, interestingly enough, one day I did a search trying an alternate spelling, which the C-O-L-V-E-R is the spelling that they used in England. And up came Reverend Solomon P. Calder. He was ordained in New York State shortly after 1810, and he continued his ministry in that state. And that's all the um, diocese knew about his service, um, and that was it. But what I found was he was in the book of Free Will Baptists. So he was a Baptist minister, not a Methodist. We do not know anything about his ministry, what churches he may have served. Um, we just know that he was officially ordained. And in this book that's at the bottom of the page, um, this movement uh, traveled up along the Seneca River. Uh, and that's where Solomon was living at that time. He was born in uh, 1787, likely in Scioto because that's where his daddy was living at the time, working at the mill. The next uh, trail that I found of him was in 1808. He had an uncollected letter uh, at the post office per the Geneva newspaper. 
In 1810 census, he was living in Romulus, and the census said he had one slave. I have no explanation for that. It's the only time that um, there was any evidence or listing of slave. I don't know if it's a census error or if he did indeed have a slave at that time. I just can't answer that. There's no other census that indicates that he was a slave owner prior to that or after that. One surprise was I didn't know that Solomon lived in Hector, which is where his uncle Phineas was living. He purchased 50 acres on Lot 50 in Junius for $550 from the Brundage family. And then in 1815, as uncle Phineas had a little scrape with a land deed um, with William Hagerman or Hagman with land that was in Covert and Ovid. And the sheriff deed was drawn and guess whose name was on the deed, Solomon P. Culver. As a result of that particular transaction, his uncle Phineas tried to get the first judge of Tompkins County impeached, but he was not successful. Then in 1818, he purchased um, another 50 acres for $1,000 from the Matthews, and that land was listed to be along the Black Brook in Seneca County. Well, he was listed as a pioneer of Black Brook in Seneca County. And this particular write-up had a pretty interesting explanation of what life was like at that time. It says, before 1818 or 1819, all of this neighborhood and coming to the falls had to come through the woods or else go around by Deacon Duran's and come by way of the Springbrook Road. But at that time, the road was cut through the forest and made from Russell's South to the Turnpike. Much of the land being low and uh, swampy had to be paved corduroy fashion with logs laid crossways. So he was living in swamp land, basically, at this point. But he was listed and recognized as a pioneer, so that kind of surprised me. We suspected that Solomon was married twice, and trying to prove or even find who his first wife was took me forever. I kind of had uh, suspicions of some of the children, so I started gathering death certificates. They all said Solomon, but no wife. Then Phoebe Ann, the uh, firstborn daughter, hers proved to have the right information because hers said Solomon and it said Eliza. Then I went looking for land deeds and sure enough in 1827 there's a land deed where Solomon and Eliza sell land in the property at Black Brook. Then there's another transaction the same year from Elas Breeze of Elmira and that was his uncle Phineas's in-laws. So there's constant um, connections between his uncle and him. And then in 1831, he actually owned land on the Cuda Reservation uh, in the Canoga Village, and he sells that land to Ruliff Peterson. Now the Petersons, if you go back a couple generations, were slaveholders. So I don't know, is there a chance that maybe the one slave in the 1810 census was the Peterson slave, it just happened to be there? We just don't know. And his oldest daughter, Phoebe, willed an awful lot of money to descendants of Ruliff Peterson. So I think there's a chance that she might be a Peterson, but I don't think Ruloff is her, is her daddy, because if you go back to her birth year, uh, the early census, uh, Ruloff and his wife had no children, but his two brothers have a daughter her age. So I think a little more research, there is a um, surrogate record in Seneca County my next vacation, guess where I'm going? <laughs> I want to know the relationship between uh, the Petersons and the Culvers. In 1832, Solomon um, sells the land that was the quick claim deed, but he sells it to a man named Joseph B. Jackson of Lodi. And it's in the deed, it says quick claim present for only $80. And this was multi hundred acre property. So he's family. But what I thought was interesting, if you look at the census, Jackson and Hagerman are neighbors. So I don't know if this whole deal with Phineas going sour, if this was a land transaction between in-laws uh, on his end. But it was interesting that um, they were neighbors. Solomon then comes to Sterling. He's here about 1837, and this is the uh, card that Haley had shared with me years ago. The children attended school uh, in District 5. And you can see the school census where it lists some of the children. These are all children with Solomon's second wife.
Another interesting entry for Solomon comes from a newspaper in 1845. Like many men of Sterling, he served as a constable. And there is his claim of what he was paid in 1845 for that service. This is the little ballot that my sister and I have had long discussions about. In 1846, New York had the opportunity to amend the state constitution that would allow free blacks to have the same voting rights as whites. Solomon Culver and many men, uh, this is just a partial list you see on the screen because it wouldn't all fit on the page. These men chose to either not vote at all, abstain from voting, or voted no to the suffrage, to allow uh, blacks, free blacks to have the same voting rights. If we look at the Gen Web map of 1853, we can see where S.P. Culver, uh, in the middle, kind of the left-hand side, it says S.P. Culver, lot 27. If you notice, there's a school number 10 there with the blue arrow, and then school five is the school at the upper part of the screen with the red arrow. And all of his children were educated uh, at school number five. By 1855, Solomon's starting to suffer advanced age. And the overseer of the poor records, in July of 1855, uh, he received some financial relief. And one of the things that they delivered to Solomon's family was, uh, looks like 16 and a half pounds of pork. And I'm pretty sure that was to feed his many children. In 1859, you'll notice that Solomon's land is now Mrs. Culver. Well, the assessment records for 1859 still show Solomon as the, the owner. Uh, but in 1860, uh, the assessment record changes to Mrs. Culver. So that suggests that Solomon, Solomon died somewhere between 1859 and 1860. Where he's buried is still a mystery. We do not know. Then if we go forward to 1875, Solomon's homestead is now listed as W. Booth. Well, that's his son-in-law. His daughter Jane, actually the deed in 1872, the deed is in her name, but yet the map maker makes it in her husband's name. I thought that was how typical of the time period. And she purchased the uh, lot from William Kirk Jr. for $100. 1875 is also the last time we see his second wife, Rebecca, so I believe she likely passed away sometime after that. Her grave is also unknown. If we were to look at Solomon's immediate family, this is what it would look like, folks. He had anywhere uh, up to about 19 children, based on the census. I believe he has another son and another daughter that I have not identified yet. I believe his first wife was Eliza or Elizabeth, and her maiden name may be Peterson, or a female branch of the Petersons. That will be confirmed uh, at a later date. He had uh, his daughter, Phoebe Ann, uh, who married Asa Southwell and then married again to Robert Sickles. Much of the children from the first family are buried out in Seneca Falls area. He had a son, Peter, Lewis, who, uh, I haven't found Lewis. And then he had Mary and Ralph Peterson, Alva. They lived in Auburn, which my grandmother never ever spoke of having other Culver relatives that close to us. Then he had another daughter, Eliza Helen, and a son, Stephen. Then he marries Rebecca Sweet. I have the death records for all of the adult children in this group, and the death certificates suggest that Jane and Eveline were born in Oswego. I cannot find any proof that they ever lived in Oswego, but that's what the documents say. Jane Culver, uh, from his second wife, her obituary actually led me to her sister, Mahedible, who was called Hetty. He had two sets of twins with his second wife, Eveline and Angeline. I have not found Angeline, but Eveline married Ezra Kilmer. She's buried in Auburn. Elos Culver um, went to Canada, and that's where he's buried. Henry uh, lived in Fairhaven in Oswego. He's buried here um, in Sterling. Hetty moved to Michigan. Martha died young. Julia Edda was his uh, youngest surviving daughter, and I descend from her as well as the two guests that are with us tonight. And then he had a child, Lucy, who died here in Sterling, also as an infant. What's interesting about this family is their spelling. 
All of the children from the first wife spell their name C-O-L-L-B-E-R. The children from the second wife spell it C-U-L-B-E-R. Solomon struggled throughout his lifetime to retain the C-O-L-L-V-E-R, and he was unsuccessful. So he became a C-U-L-V-E-R uh, as time passed. Much to my surprise, I found the headstone of Elos Culver. He spells his name C-O-L-L-V-E-R. And the death certificate for Mahatable in Michigan spelled her name C-O-L-L-V-E-R. So you have split spelling, and it's all one family. So that is the immediate family of Solomon Culver of Sterling. His uh, son-in-laws and some of his children, uh, you see there's soldiers listed there. They were all Civil War uh, service. Jane's husband, William Booth, is buried here in Sterling. We, at first, I thought he served with a unit that enlisted from Port Byron. There is a William Booth from Port Byron, but he's his cousin. The William Booth that married Jane enlisted at Auburn, and I believe he served in the 3rd Light Artillery. Emmeline's husband, uh, Ezra, served in the, I believe it was Ninth Heavy Artillery. Uh, he's buried in Auburn. And Mahatable's husband, George Eaton, he's buried in Michigan. He was a soldier. And Julia Etta, who we called Nanny, uh, married George Kilmer, and that was Ezra's brother. So we have kind of double cousin tree in, the, um, in that generation. And George also served the Ninth Heavy Artillery. He's buried in Port Byron. The occupations of his sons and son-in-laws I thought was quite remarkable. We really don't officially know what Solomon's occupation was other than laborer, but that could have been his ministry. It could have been farming. We just don't know. But his son Peter was a furniture dealer and a farmer. His son Ralph was a shoemaker. Elva was a cooper, barrel maker. And Henry was a house painter. If we look at his son-in-laws, Asa was a um, cooper. Robert Sickles was a machinist. William Booth was a molder, Ezra Kilmer was an engraver, George Eaton was also another barrel maker, and my grandpa George, um, he had many occupations, but he actually became uh, a brick mason. He attended a course in Syracuse in 1880, uh, and that was his occupation uh, after that. If I could call a document beautiful, this is what I would call this document. This was sent to me by a newly discovered relative who lives in Washington State by the name of Dale Culver. It was uh, obtained through the Fulton Postcard site. I had searched this family years ago, so I haven't searched recently, and this popped up. And when I saw the surrogate notice, this is for Phoebe, Solomon's eldest daughter with his first wife, it lists everybody. So when I saw this document, my heart skipped a beat, because now I have proof that these kids all knew each other. The children from the first wife knew the children of the second wife. That just amazed me. And her surrogate record is 200 plus pages. And I have a date with the court, uh, with the clerk in Seneca County to view it on my next vacation. So I'm looking forward to that particular trip. His eldest daughter with his second wife, Jane, um, <coughs> this obituary was very uh, yielding. Uh, because it said that she had lived in Michigan, which is how I found Hetty. She died actually in the home of Julia, my uh, great-great-grandmother in Port Byron. And she was uh, transported here to Sterling. She's buried in an unmarked grave next to her husband, William Booth. And out of all of his children, I only have a picture of Julia, which is uh, my great-great-grandmother. She was born in 1846 in Sterling. She died in 1939. Uh, at the home of my grandmother. She had broken her hip and my grandmother um, cared for her and she died um, while recuperating from that injury. And then to the right I have a picture of Nami with my aunt and uncle, my uncle George and my aunt Elizabeth. We called her Hund. Uh, uncle George was, uh, had he lived longer than he did, he probably would have been a physician. He was a physician's assistant at the CCC camp in Seneca County and contracted typhoid, so he died very, very young. We don't have a lot of pictures of Nami, but to have at least any pictures from this time period, we're very blessed. So that is basically, in a nutshell, the story of Solomon Culver and his many, many children. His descendants, uh, he still has descendants in Canada. He still has descendants as far as Washington State. 
So I was very privileged to be with you tonight to present this information because for years and years, <coughs> nobody knew the ancestry of Solomon P. Caller, and now we do. So thank you very much. Thank you.